All right. What do you think, Case? Should we get started? Yeah. See how uh, I'm sure some people will jump in here and there. We'll join up. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah, we we can start. And uh, so thank you, Nathan. <clears throat> um, welcome everyone to yet another uh, webinar um, in and with uh, the Links project. Uh, my name is Kees Boersma. I'm, I'm the PI of the Lynx project and together with Nathan, I'm coordinating um, uh, the things that we do in the Lynx project and, and Nathan then also asked me to uh, uh, share this meeting. Um, um, uh, so it is a meeting to uh, think about and rethink um, uh, social media and crowdsourcing uh, in disaster management in um, in different scenarios, in different contexts, and also in the different phases of um, of the disaster management cycle, as we define them. But then also in particular in in the phase of preparation and 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 uh, potential also prevention, and to see um, how social media, in terms of a data um, source, can be of a helping hand, um, and to what sort of issues are we running into. Would we take that um, source of data uh, more seriously for what we do in um, in, in disaster uh, management? And we then is uh, scholars and practitioners alike. Um, so and that um, uh, can bring about a really interesting conversation. So for today, um, actually, we invited two um, experts in the field. Um, so welcome to you all. Um, I will briefly tell uh, a, a bit about you and also the setup of the whole webinar. But um, um, once you start talking, please also explain your expertise and, and, and your experience so um, that we can have a really engaged uh, discussion. So we have Valerio uh, Lorini, um, really an expert in disaster risk reduction, um, working at the e, uh, EU Joint Research Center in ISPRA. Um, and we're really curious, uh, Valerio, to 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 pick your brain on 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 the issues that we are of interest in in in, in the Links project and beyond. So social media in particular. Uh, Chiara uh, Pinaretti, um, a data an a, a analyst. Um, I think also working with uh, East uh, uh, Joint Research Center. Um, but also in particular in the context of um, healthcare and, and uh, healthcare related issues, societal issues and, and dynamic work environments. And then we have uh, George Gomez, a, a chief operation officer at uh, FOST Portugal. And as we, as you may know, the FOST ambition is really also to, to engage um, uh, citizens in, in uh, times of disasters, but also in, in uh, preparation, prevention, with also an eye on, on new technologies, particularly also uh, social media. Um, so what we did in advance, uh, Nathan and I, together with the three experts, is, um, is, is propose a, a, a series of questions that we ask you to reflect upon um, and then enroll into the discussion that we have um, in the Links project and beyond about social media um, in, in the context of disasters. So if I may, um, Chiara, I, I, I would like to start with you. And, and, and so we sent you that question, and but I can repeat that question that you can reflect upon. So, so there are many uh, social media systems and information systems being, being integrated. Um, in particular, we're also with the global disaster alert and coordination system. So quite a mouthful. Um, and that has to do with the alert phase. Um, but then uh, what, how, do you, how do you perceive that, think about that also in the different other phases of disaster management, the response phase? And can you also provide some examples or in which um, social media data was key to improve um, the, uh, some components in disaster management, in, for example, situation awareness. Yeah, thanks a lot, Kies, for your nice introduction and uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody, to the old participants. And thanks for organizing uh, this occasion for brainstorming also from my point of view. I will provide the feedback also on the operational use uh, 
of social media that here at the Joint Research Center of the European Commission we have been doing so far. Uh, but before starting, uh, uh, I will, with going directly into the social media, I will provide a bit of background on what is GDAX uh, to understand uh, which are the needs uh, uh, that we are facing and also how we try to, uh, to manage them uh, and to cover them with the uh, uh, use of social media. So uh, explaining briefly GDAX, GDAX uh, represents a collaborative initiative between the European Commission and the United Nations. So it started in 2004 uh, when we decided to join our effort uh, on the European Commission side. The Joint Research Center is responsible for the multi hazard early warning part of GDAX. So it means a heads up system based on impact estimation for humanitarians. So mm -hmm. to know if a disaster can, uh, if an event could or not evolve into a disaster. And we consider also the coping capacity of the country in our algorithm to understand if the country is able to cope or not with that disaster and in case they could request humanitarian assistance. Uh, then there is a session that is managed by uh, UNOCHA, so from United Nations, the coordination of humanitarian affairs, yep. that is the virtual OSOC. So is the virtual on-site operation coordination center. It is mostly the tent that is installed to manage a disaster by the United Nations. But this is virtual. So as soon as the disaster strikes, all the humanitarians at the global level start to exchange information and data about the ongoing disaster to understand which is the real impact on that. Uh, and then if it is a real disaster and the humanitarian need is needed, then the, the real tent uh, is installed uh, on the uh, affected area. And then there is also the satellite mapping component uh, that uh, is uh, uh, mostly the coordination of who is mapping what and where. And uh, next year will be 20, 20 years of operation. So we have more than 40,000 uh, register organization and humanitarians, but also citizens that want to be informed about the impact of disasters around the globe. Uh, but we are keep uh, asking us uh, uh, a key question, which is, is still GDAX after 20 years fit for purpose, which is the, because also the technology, as you also said, evolve. So are we still uh, uh, using the, the cut to edge technology and also the information need of the humanitarians of the disaster manage evolves. Uh, but uh, we, we saw years ago now, uh, we saw a key gap, information gap in the aftermath of a disaster. So uh, which is the real impact between the impact estimation of our models and the impact information that came usually hours after the disasters uh, directly from the media or from the national authorities that communicate about the disaster. But in the meantime, that everybody, since uh, the disaster occurs, uh, uh, in these first hours, uh, we have this information gap uh, that we need to cover from estimation, impact estimation to impact assessment. And this is where the social media play uh, a huge role in this. And uh, we have been doing this scraping uh, by via expert assessment uh, on the social media since years uh, to catch uh, the first videos or communication from the affected area. But uh, it's a huge amount uh, of information there. And this is where the uh, social, the initiative uh, led by Valeria, that he will talk about that. Uh, uh, fortunately, we had this uh, in our expertise in the GRC. And they do this, this automatic analysis of huge amount uh, of information uh, to prioritize uh, and to try to uh, provide us with the key information of the impact uh, from the field uh, with a realistic, uh, uh, as much as possible, uh, uh, impact information. 
And uh, this is crucial, the case, because we have uh, been uh, trained the models uh, for uh, uh, years uh, now, but uh, uh, a very operational use of this information was for the, uh, from the night of February, uh, the 6th of February this year, with a 7.8 earthquake in Turkey and Syria. Uh, when it striked, uh, there was the desperate need. All the humanitarian community was looking. Also, the, UC, the European Civil Protection Mechanism was activated by Turkey. And everybody was struggling to get information on what was going on from the field. And fortunately, through this uh, collaboration, we managed first to get information from the people that were stuck under the rubble. And thanks to the collaboration with Vorst and Jorge, we'll talk about that, we got uh, uh, georeference data from the people that were communicating from social media uh, under the rubble. Uh, and we provided this information to the search and rescue teams uh, on the field. And then also they were able to provide us with information on the critical infrastructure, also because there were growing concerns from the team on the field that were asking, are we safe? operating the stream of a dam and uh, also mostly Valerio provided us uh, with uh, uh, automatic extracted data of the affected dam also with images and information we provide uh, uh, dam discharge models uh, based uh, on the potential to estimate the potential impact uh, of this. Uh, there are limitations for sure. At the moment, we already identify them uh, mostly uh, how to retrieve the data from social media coming from authoritative sources, because this is crucial, but to, to do it automatically. Also, the language in this case is a barrier because the models have to be trained uh, with uh, uh, local uh, uh, terminology with the local languages. Uh, and also to try to ensure the flexibility of the different, uh, to try to adapt the system to the different social media platforms uh, that we you were referring to. But uh, fortunately we have this in, in house expertise uh, uh, with the social media for disaster risk management initiative. And I, I still thank them for this support. Then uh, I hope that I try to manage to mm -hmm. your question. So yeah. in case I'm here to reply. No, but thank you. And even more than that, it's really inspiring also, also to see how you start working with the humanitarian sector, not only in terms of coordination efforts like in UN Archa, but then also in in how to deal with 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 a huge amount of data that that then sometimes is uh, 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 should, should you should take an effort to analyze the data make sense of the data and support and so on before i go to valerio because then i'm curious okay about all that um, generated data how to deal with that is is you was you are mainly referring to um, things like needs assessments and the response phase but early on in your in your uh, introduction, you also refer to the coping mechanisms and coping capacity yeah, of of the of member states and or uh, European countries. And you was referring to early warning systems, right? Um, so is that also something that is of concern for you um, in relation to the topics that you are addressing? Yeah, also because uh, as uh, GDAX, we don't have the mandate. Uh to alert the population. The mandate to alert the population is up to the member state. Uh, but we provide uh, uh, with a, a global algorithm mm -hmm. to, for the humanitarians. Uh, so it, it is crucial in this case to collaborate with the national authorities, or for example, also now there is, there is this crucial initiatives uh, uh, led by WMO, uh, together with uh, UNDRR, uh, that is mm -hmm. uh, early warning for all. Uh, right. That for for in the next years, uh, all citizens in the world should be uh, targeted by early warning system. Should be able yeah. to be alerted, mm -hmm. and this is crucial also to start the analysis uh, of the social media because as soon as an early warning is issued, then the process could start and all the information that are needed could be already on the table to be analyzed and provided 
to the decision makers and uh, in case of a huge disaster as the Turkey and Syria earthquake mm -hmm. to the people that are, for example, in this case, the search and rescue teams. Yeah, yeah. No, thank you. Really, really fascinating. Good work. <laughs> So um, yeah, and, and then then talking about data and data coming from different sources uh, that you are also already started to refer to um, data generated by formal authorities versus the data generated by non-authoritative sort of um, uh, uh, sources, huh? and and other than formal authorities. And and Valerio, we posted that question to you. Is, is how can you define who is formal authority in a context in which so many different actors and uh, but also citizens right are affected by the by the disaster by by the crisis gener generating also that data so how you do, do you deal with that uh, authoritative user generated data versus non authoritative user generate uh, generated data how do you how do you deal with the with the data and coming from different data sources so what's your take on that, given your experience? Thanks a lot, uh, Keith, for the question and the introduction. And thanks to Chiara also for uh, her uh, introduction of, uh, of our tool. Um, indeed, we uh, actually, um, my research, since uh, I am a computer scientist, I have a PhD in artificial intelligence and uh, so I am a software, uh, let's say, uh, developer, a researcher in, uh, in uh, algorithm and artificial intelligence. So my, um, what we wanted to see is uh, to try to use the expertise or to apply uh, artificial intelligence to uh, crisis response or to uh, crisis management, disaster risk uh, reduction. Um, when we talk about authoritative data here, at least uh, here at the, um, at the Joint Research Center at the European Commission, we uh, refer to the data that are um, also called uh, traditional uh, data for uh, um, crisis responders, for the organization that has somehow mandates for dealing with the crisis. Uh, we co I consider uh, authoritative data, uh, for instance, the meteorological data that we can collect uh, before, during, and after an event, uh, but also uh, satellite images uh, coming from um, Copernicus, for instance, when a member state has triggered um, the acquisition of uh, Im image uh, satellite images, or uh, observation from local authorities, for instance, in a, uh, some, somehow um, in some places where you have an emergency, uh, a flood, for instance. Uh, um, there was a um, once I remember that we we were in Genova in in Italy and uh, where some a lot of times you have uh, flash floods and they developed their own way of the understanding the seriousness of of the floods at the time they were saying that actually they had the police uh, cars going around the cities and actually looking at the if the water was below uh, the tires. Of, of the car or not. And so that was a very good time uh, rule. So uh, any type of information uh, can help during the disaster response. Mm, and if it comes from an authoritative source for someone that is organized to deal with data is uh, considered somehow validated without noise. While if it comes from uh, users on social network uh, are considered non-authoritative, and they can be biased. They are not uh, validated. They have some. Uh, they may have uh, problems because they report a situation that is not happening. So, <clears throat> what we uh, what we do with the um, so we uh, thought uh, starting in 2016-17, uh, we thought that social media could help, as uh, Chiara already explained, to let's say fill the gap between the risk analysis and the impact assessment uh, during a disaster. So the sooner we can get some ground truth data that is really ground truth, we can also then uh, start or ignite a, 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 um, a good uh, feedback or a cycle where we can give provide feedback to the authoritative sources or, or we can select better the authoritative data 
as well. Uh, or we can highlight, for instance, uh, areas that uh, are not uh, taken into consideration based on static data. Uh, for instance, uh, we, through the social media, uh, during the IET in 20, uh, earthquake in 2020, I think, uh, we were able to spot some roads that were closed or damaged, so we included them into an area of interest that were not taken into, was not taken into consideration in the, be in the beginning. Um, and what we do, since we work, uh, we started working uh, in the framework of the Copernicus Emergency Management Services, we started working with floods. Uh, we use authoritative data in order to understand where an area we have we have uh, different data that can tell us uh, uh, where it's going to rain, uh, the condition of the soil. We have a hydrological model that can somehow forecast uh, with a certain degree of certainty if there could be a flood in the next uh, 24 or 48 hours. So we take this into consideration and we start monitoring social media. Then starting with this first experiment, we uh, at the CRC, we are in between, let's say, a research, there is pure research and academia on one side and the crisis responders or crisis managers on the other side. So uh, we cannot work on one single event and then to prepare the next article or to do the next study. We wanted to go, uh, if we want, decide to do a tool, such a, such a tool, we needed to do it uh, for all the events, or this is the target, for all the events, uh, for all the languages, and that covers uh, the globe, because that's the mandate of Copernicus, and the natural next step is to integrate our data in GDAX. That is what uh, Chiara was, uh, was mentioning. So to do that, actually, is a... Is a project of it becomes a project of applied artificial intelligence. Uh, is a, a project. So to do that, we needed to have a, um, an, an infrastructure that is scalable, that works uh, 24/7, 365 days. Of course, with some pickups because we are a research center. And um, so we decided to start immediately to build a. Uh, machine learning models that could uh, annotate these uh, uh, thousands or millions of uh, of tweets uh, to for relevance to disaster, but also to impacts. I'm not going into the detail, but um, we can, we can we can discuss or you can ask me if you if you are interested in that. Um, the point is that we need to we needed to work towards a, an operational system that is reliable and is uh, so it, it has to be. Uh, fast also in uh, in reacting uh, because we, as we said, uh, when an event starts, we have to immediately uh, start providing information. Not being, I'm not the only one working on this. Uh, the research is now these uh, models that we use for annotating social media or user generated data for what it matters um, is mature. We have seen several examples. So the, the step that we wanted to do further, which is what we have done, is to use this model or to, to ask ourselves, okay, we are good in doing a classification of data. What, what do we do now? So we started working with uh, crisis responders or practitioners in order to understand the real needs and to understand why they are not using the social media data. That is why we started with the, uh, we started a task force of uh, researchers and practitioners because we understood in the beginning that uh, practitioners and researchers uh, speak two different languages. It's like they are from two different worlds. So we wanted to create this task force and we started also a workshop, uh, which is a yearly workshop. And uh, Jorge is one of the, one of the member of this task force and he's also one of the big sponsor and promoter of this uh, task force and he is very involved into the into the into our work what we uh, started doing then is to decide and to check how we could serve our model and data to help uh, crisis responders and that is how we get to the example that Chiara was doing of the uh, turkey earthquake the earthquake in in turkey we used our uh, uh, platform to collect data in real time to filter them in real time uh, and then we started looking at the data and to uh, think about um, what to do. I mean, 
we had already models that were able to to be adapted for uh, special needs. In our case, then we were able to detect impact and we started uh, detecting impact on critical infrastructure. So the, we had some taxonomy of data and we uh, filtered out uh, images, uh, sorry, uh, yes, images, but also text that are, were relevant for impacts in a specific, uh, but specific infrastructure. So when we needed to look at dams, for instance, we were able to, to see and to check that uh, there were dams. Uh, when then we, we realized that there was a need for uh, people uh, requesting because probably the, in, the, in this case, there were um, the phone system had uh, some problems or, uh, or others. Uh, then we uh, it was quite immediate with uh, Jorge. We talked a bit and we decided to we said okay well we are collecting a lot of data. What can we what can we do? The crisis responders they told us uh, straight uh, uh, in the beginning they they been clear with us. They say uh, listen we need to look for our uh, safety. We don't have any big computer to uh, digest your data so. Uh, because we sent uh, data in a straight format, tabular format, and they say, no, we, we, we can't do anything with this data. So mm -hmm. uh, then with, with the help of uh, Jorge, we were able to uh, automatically detect a, a city or a zone of a, or an area. And then they were able uh, overnight actually to check the good messages and to detect them at the level of the street. And that was a, a great example of how and where and how far we can go with the with the collaboration between uh, uh, digital experts in the domain, which are also volunteers like Post, and the operational tool and uh, the need of uh, having someone that is expert of in the field of crisis management, uh, but is also savvy about the technologies that can be used. Because uh, having the guy in the crisis room, the IT guy, as it was once, is not enough. It's not, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not enough at the moment. We need something more because the data is increasing, is increasing, is expanding. And so when you have a lot of more data, you have to deal also with uh, problems that comes for uh, misinformation, for instance. Although the natural disasters are still a bit safe because you don't have people putting picture of a fake disaster. What right. you can find is you can, what you can find is people maybe uh, by mistake, uh, retweeting an image that has been already done, for, or it comes from another disaster. So you be you need to be a bit careful, but this can mm -hmm. be done with some tools, uh, automated tools. Right. Yeah. No, thank you so much. Really uh, knowledgeable um, explanation of, of of what you are doing and also the challenges you are running into. Um, I definitely recognize there's sometimes two different worlds of, of researchers and practitioners that sometimes don't speak each other's language. So, so and you are coming up with, with, with I think what you call co-design of solutions, right? So really co-creating the solutions that we are um, uh, looking for. Uh, just as a, <clears throat> one follow-up question before I go to George is, is, um, is again your take on um, validating data? So, so sort of, Per definition, you said, hey, data from authoritative sources is validated. At least you consider that to be validated. But uh, I think in, in, when you look at actual practices, and that's my question to you, um, they can be um, uh, with good intentions, but they can be proven wrong uh, down the line. Versus um, data from non-authoritative sources, they can be uh, very useful. And maybe uh, in the end, uh, the correct information. So, so. Uh, my question then is, shouldn't we rethink we validate uh, data from all those sources in this particular uh, context of, of, of disasters? And shouldn't we sort of not abandon completely, but rethink the traditional way we do validation of data? What's your take on that? Uh, you know, um, let me check if I understood your question. You are mentioning about the validation of the authoritative data using non-authoritative data. Yeah, or or even pre presenting their own data, you consider that to be validated, right? So if data is, uh, that's at least what I understood from your explanation, data from authoritative sources, they are considered to be validated. But, and again, not with 
uh, uh, asking their intentions, but with, and it can be with good intention, but down the line, they can be proven wrong because, hey, there's a difference. So how do you deal with that constantly evolving situation versus uh, evaluating data uh, from the different sources? Okay, now I now I understand the, the question. But I think it's I think what you can you are you are saying is interesting and can be done. But um, more on a, on the authoritative data that are probabilistic, let's say, because we we have the deter deterministic data, and in that case, you I mean, if you don't consider this validated, then you have to you can you cannot do anything. But uh, for the probabilistic data, then you can actually use uh, this such information. For instance, a forecast is uh, usually a probabilistic model. It's an ensemble no? of different, you get the input data and you have different, uh, different perturbation of the initial condition and you have a simulation. In that case, non-authoritative data could help giving a feed, in giving a feedback to the model and say, listen, your model is doing going towards this type of uh, simulation. So you have to take this simulation more into consideration than another one, for instance. Or you can, or I think we use the, and we push for the use of our data also with our colleagues at uh, mapping, uh, rapid mapping uh, team uh, within Copernicus because, uh, uh, and from time to time we exchange information because when they have to come up with the area of interest and you have, for instance, a earthquake, you usually use the area of the shake maps. You use some information that you have available at the moment, but this, but some structure or some places may be affected due to all the buildings or some other data that are not there and not validated. So in this case, the dynamic data coming from users or citizen science can be very helpful in uh, determining where the real event is happening and how it is evolving also because uh, again, uh, herd observation are very good, but if you have a flood that is building and receding, you take a picture only at certain moment. If you get this moment wrong, you don't get the maximum extent, or you get an information which is uh, somehow out of uh, of the of the which is different than the the real image. Or again, in city, for instance, where you have an, a floods, a urban floods. Uh, if you have tall buildings, narrow roads, a lot of glasses, uh, if you don't have leader data from the space, it's, it's difficult to see the extent of a, exactly. of a disaster. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Very clear answer. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And, hey, so, and then, yeah. Before we jump to George, we have a couple, one question in the chat, and, okay. and I've also got a question if we can. Pose Maybe it. you can raise them, uh, Nathan. Or... Yeah, quickly, if you don't yeah. mind. Uh, first, I actually I have a follow up question. So thanks a lot, Valerio, for the explanation. Really nice. Uh, maybe you can go a little bit more into depth about how you did the the dam um, analysis for Turkey. So if I understood correctly, you used um, was it just satellite imagery and then ground truthing through social media pictures of the damage, or did you? How did you? assess that the infrastructure was safe for first responders to approach if i also understood kiara's point earlier that's my question one and um, no actually we didn't assess the safety of the dams we were just uh, we were just uh, uh, it was a, i think kiara correct me if i'm wrong but it was one of the first reports generated after the event and so uh, they wanted to to check what was the extent of the damages and uh, which infrastructure were uh, involved potentially in order to then, uh, again, to support then the proper crisis responders and then to, to, to check and to, to, to follow up uh, with uh, some actions. What we have done, we have an automatic classify, classifier of text and images. Uh, the, classif the text classifier is uh, multilingual, so we use the 32,000 uh, data from historic events in 10 different languages uh, that we annotated. Uh, we tried to cover different alphabets, so we cover a bit uh, globally, and then we use, uh, uh, we use embeddings, multilingual and pre-trained embeddings to extend the semantic of our model. So if we have a, uh, 
to 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 show as a very silly example. If I have the word uh, cat uh, and it, it is transformed into a number, 0 0.1, um, if I have the word gato in Spanish, this will have a, a, the same number, 0 0.1. In this way, we are able to extend the languages and the semantic because we cover pretty well the different languages. And so with this model, we detected the, uh, if a text is talking about an impact or not. So if it talks about uh, damages, people injured uh, in, in any, in different um, sentences, then we start looking at the names and the combination of words that can uh, define the terms. And in that case, we, we found it. And also attached to the same message, there was pictures that has been classified by, the, by, the, by our classifier as relevant for the earthquake. So with these two proof, we were able to actually tell Chiara that, yes, we think there is also a dam in, uh, in Syria that has been uh, impacted. I think, thanks a lot. That answers the question. I think I understand more clearly. I did have a question about the data models, but I, I think you've, or the language models, but I think you've kind of covered it now. Um, so I'll jump just to the chat for the sake of time. Uh, Katerina asked, how are you addressing challenges of data interoperability when integrating modern social media features in a leg legacy platforms, especially in the context of real-time analytics and user experience, such as live streams, chats, um, and even more advanced AI-driven content. Does it make sense? Mm -hmm. I think, yes, I, I think yes. I, and uh, what we do, because as, as I said, we want to have our platform to serve uh, uh, crisis responders. So our, and we have to define the boundaries of our platform and our system. We wanted to be f as flexible as possible. Also to, also because uh, social media, in my opinion, are here to stay. They will last forever. But today we have Twitter. Tomorrow we have something else. There is a new social media. There will be some other uh, bottom-up initiatives providing data. So I think uh, this is what also the questions is, is referring to. So our platform is able to process text and images uh, and to annotate it um, e automatically. The, the, the part before is we let the part before to the single uh, group. For instance, the flood teams uh, is uh, generating uh, uh, forecast and areas where they think it may something may happen. So I take then uh, name of locations and I start listening to social media or to Twitter or some other in test that we have done. Uh, even with uh, with Jorge, we try to get some data from. Uh, I try to get some data from crowd tangles during events, but we extracted then text. So once you have the sentence, then the data are all the same. That's how we try to stay up to date or to cope with this new. Got it. Platform. Thanks a lot. I see George's hand is up too. He's ready to jump right. in the conversation. <laughs> and 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 but, but that's a good bridge, I think, uh, George. Um, uh, uh, you can of course respond to the discussion and join the discussion that we are having right now. But yeah. also we are curious to, to, to learn from you. So we are talking about the quality of data all the time. And, and as we well, well know is, is on social media, one concern is also about the quality of, of, of information or even you can, you can talk about disinformation and rumors and all that. Um, Valerio is sometimes referring to that, uh, uh, not explicitly, but but to that quality of the data. So, so what, what's your take on that? But and again, feel free to also reflect on the discussion that we are having right now. But what's your take on that disinformation and rumors? And also, hey, should that be uh, uh, of more of a concern for the policymakers than it is right now? Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, and first of all, uh, thank you for having me. Um, I'm going to I'm going to go back a bit, a bit uh, you know, for to what uh, Valeria was just saying and to the question posed by um, uh, Katarina, because I think it's a very important question. And the reality is that we only have access to the 
that uh, that platforms make available. So, you know, in the case of Twitter, they have an API that uh, used to be free for researchers. Now it's not anymore. Uh, we have CrowdTangle for Meta products, which is a text-based uh, query that allows you to extract information uh, on uh, Mastodon, on Fediverse. You already have APIs that allow you to, but for instance, uh, for Telegram and other, other applications, we do not have access. So without that access, we don't. We are blind to that information. So this is a this is a a, a situation that I actually think that bridges with your question because under the Digital Services Act, uh, which is now in place and is going to be in full force uh, from uh, the beginning of the year, uh, platforms, very large online platforms and search engines, will have to give more data and more ways to access the data uh, from uh, uh, to researchers and to well the public at large. Um, I am the co-chair of the crisis response uh, subgroup of the European Commission, the permanent task force on the code of practice on this information. And of course, that this information during crisis is something that uh, is um, a problem. I think that uh, uh, the, your first your first question, Valerio, I understood it totally on a, on a different scope, uh, which was how can official data uh, be authoritative if for instance, you have a state actor that is uh, that is trying to uh, not tell the whole story to the population, for instance, which is something that we see in some regimes and in some situations. We've seen it in Mozambique. We have seen it a bit in Turkey as well. So, and uh, for for you to have an idea, immediately after the earthquake conspiracy theories regarding that this was an American submarine that caused the earthquake because of the war in Ukraine. And yes, it gets crazy. But um, but the thing is that this information is also part of the noise that we have to filter. Yeah. So this information is a huge problem. Uh, that the, the fact that we are allowing in some platforms this information to run rampant is also going to hinder this effort. And this is something that uh, at a European Commission level, especially on the task force, on the permanent task force, on the Code of Practice and Information, but also on the Digital Services Act, is being taken into account. Of course, that is a collaborative effort. Uh, the code is a voluntary, a voluntary commitment. So, for for you to have an idea, Twitter was a was one of the signatories, and after Elon Musk bought it, they just dropped out of the code. Uh, under Article uh, Forty Five, if I if I'm not mistaken, there will be there will be a mandate for the platforms to have um, to have. Um, these voluntary crisis response mechanisms that are going to be also included because we we made sure that uh, natural disasters such as the earthquakes and floods are going to be included as a crisis. So, you know, not only political advertising or political elections, but also that natural disasters are part of the definition <clears throat> of what a crisis is. I hope that I, uh, I answered your questions. Yeah, definitely, and but but then also you raise sort of a a, a concern is that that hey are we also relying upon man, the many platforms also by private or private companies and 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 um, again that brings um, that raises a lot of uh, other issues and concerns. What's your take on um, on policy and policy makers when it comes to regulation, for example, of well maybe also the data. Um, in terms of implementing fact check, for example, and but also regulating the the, the very platforms uh, of the. But what's your take on that? Well, our, our opinion is that uh, you know, especially with the DSA, the DSA is really a strong body of uh, of legislation, and uh, you know, it's uh, it's uh, biting because you know, if platforms do not abide by it, they will be able to be fined between one percent and ten percent of their revenue. So it's not it's not something that uh, and the total worldwide revenue, not just the European one. And uh, we have a commissioner until now, which is Breton, that is very adamant, you know, to to enforce these things. Uh, on the other on the other hand, yes, we are dependent on uh, private platforms, and private platforms exist for profit, so we have to take that into account. And so, any discussions that are being had at the moment are, are having, you know, in focus that researchers such as Valerio, such as the Joint Research Center, and you know, supported by you know entities like ours that also do research on this information and 
for instance, for you to have an idea in Portugal and in Spain, as soon as the fire starts, we start monitoring social media so that we can give that information to, to authorities. Uh, and we provide uh, areas of interest uh, for uh, media so that you know there's no disinformation regarding the areas and we uh, automate that information with ways so the, that the roads are virtually digitally cut so that people do not drive there. So there's a, a lot of integration of systems that we depend on private platforms. You know, to get to get these platforms to at least give data and uh, you know give raw data is already a, a great good step. Let's see how the enforcement of this comes in the beginning of 2024. Um, for us, for instance, we were we when what comes to Twitter, we are now a bit blind. We we you know we can only do manual manual um, search. Uh, we cannot do automated search like we used to. Um, and I want to go back to 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 something which is uh, I I think that is also very important, which is nothing of this is possible without having practitioners and researchers working together. And this uh, this um, lack of common language that uh, Valeria talked about is very mm -hmm. real. And we need to find ways, we, all of us need to find ways of sometimes lowering a bit our speech, you know, in our technical talk, you know, just to have a common ground of, of, um, of, of um, communication, because that really makes results as we've seen with, uh, with, uh, with the example that Valeria gave about the earthquake in Turkey. Thank you, 100% um, on the same page. And, and hopefully webinars like this will also contribute to that mutual understanding, right? Of, uh, and, and, and um, create a common, um, maybe not even common language, but, but common sense making process of, the, uh, of, of data and data platforms. Nathan, you popped up, um, uh, follow up. Well, I was just- Mark or question? Well, I, yeah, you know, just, and if, if there's questions in the audience, just post them in the chat or raise a hand. Uh, I mean, we certainly have come across that in the links project and we took maybe the first year and a half of the project just to speak the same language across the researchers and the, some of the, the emergency management professionals that were involved in the, in the project. And even now still the terminology can be a, a bit of a, a conflict for us, but I, I wanted to ask George, I wanted to go back on, um, something you said about the you, you talked about there's yeah there's an important to have this dialogue between practitioners the needs there and the scientists and you you also rely on the policymakers and you also rely and, and this i think goes to one of the last questions but you also rely a lot on these private organizations so uh, what's are there good examples and and this goes i guess for all of you all the panelists are there a good examples in your experience of dialogue taking place between your entities and these these private uh, service providers or solution providers, some of the platform providers, and is that is their interest, um, or what is their interest? Is it genuine? Is it sort of altruistic? Is it uh, nice to have pictures of them helping disaster managers on their websites? What is the the experience there from your side? I'll jump on this first. It's a great question, Nate. Um, the you know bottom line answer is we don't know. Uh, it uh, depends from uh, you know it depends from platform to platform. It depends on the person that you are talking with. Uh, I have to say that uh, under the code of practice, we have weekly meetings with the platforms that are there, uh, and they are very open to cooperate. Um, you know, uh, not. But the thing is that we are dealing with the policy team, and so and usually this uh, this uh, the, the information that we need is not from that from that from that team; it's from other teams, <clears throat> and so the process is not as fast as we we wish uh, it could. You know, for, for uh, as an example. As soon as the Ukraine um, Ukraine uh, the you know the Ukraine uh, war started or the invasion from. Of Russia to Ukraine started, uh, we had a task force and we were able actually to have channels open with all the platforms and saying, okay, this content is false, you know, it should be demoted or it should be taken out. And, uh, you know, um, a crisis response mechanism was, was set up. 
Uh, so, but this was just like one exception. So, you know, this really works on a case by case basis. And that's why I think that, uh, you know, under the Digital Services Act, when uh, they are going to be fined, you know, if they don't provide the data and if they don't open these channels and they don't support fact checkers in the researchers, uh, then the things are going to be uh, more. Um, more open, you know, until now, it really depends on uh, who your contact is, you know, who uh, is the person that you're talking to, and how big of a media exposure you can give them, you know, if they cooperate with you, basically. Yeah, thanks, that makes sense. That's all my questions for the moment. Uh, Case, I think you're muted, sorry. I'm muted. Yeah, sorry for that. So yeah, so um, maybe Kara, also for you to to re to 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 join that that discussion. Um, maybe also about uh, this information um, and also the the role of the uh, private sector in terms of uh, um, of their platforms. You you start started talking about the coping capacity of member states and and also those societal issues. So from that perspective, what is your, also in relation to policy making, what is your um, uh, take on, 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 on that issue? Yeah, thanks a lot for, for this question because we experienced that uh, also with uh, uh, Valerio and the task force here that Jorge mentioned before at the GRC on uh, uh, disinformation, uh, for example, that was crucial during the Turkey and Syria uh, earthquake, uh, because uh, unfortunately also on uh, social media that was uh, challenging to retrieve data also uh, from this initiative uh, for that area, because there is also the uh, uncontrolled uh, uh, side of Syria that is not covered by the services, etc. But a lot of this information was taking place uh, on uh, on the several social media platforms, uh, saying that the humanitarian support uh, was not provided to the uh, uncontrolled area because of the European Commission didn't want to provide support, and this was growing in the social media, and the colleagues were able to retrieve. Uh, all this uh, information. So also in crisis management, uh, there is a huge amount of disinformation, uh, uh, mostly affecting the most vulnerable uh, uh, communities. So, and also to, to, to spread uh, all this uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, very uh, bad behavior also for providing humanitarian support. Uh, so all this collaboration uh, coming from also from volunteers in a, that sometimes know better the field, uh, they came from the also useful from the affected area, et cetera, can provide very useful information. So in this uh, uh, collaboration with all the sectors, uh, also with the private sectors uh, that has been strongly involved uh, also in providing, for example, data also uh, for, for the movements from the migration and the evacuation taking place uh, monitored by the use of the social media. So all this information coming from all the potential sources uh, are useful to understand how the crisis evolves and also how we can uh, provide uh, a more effective uh, uh, response uh, uh, from the humanitarian point of view. Yeah, no, you're very interesting, and uh, so so I recognize a lot also from from uh, talking to experts um, in the in the links project. Um, uh, maybe sort of a blunt question and and broad, but you know we we sometimes also notice that hey, the practitioners and the professionals in those organizations they know and they are aware, and 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 sometimes they also. Um, uh, are are uh, developing expertise in this field. But hey, they really also are looking for their own organization and a sort of an organizational change. So basically what is needed for those organizations to indeed embrace the things that you are um, bringing to the table, Kiara? What's your take on that? Knowing also the field a bit and talking to the professionals in their, in their organization. So, so what kind of new organizational routines, I guess that's my question, do we need in order to, to move in that direction? 
uh, yeah, it's also to recognize uh, the role that they are playing uh, and to provide uh, so to also to uh, provide them the deserved visibility uh, in the in the chain. For example, also in the uh, humanitarian partnership week uh, that mm -hmm. is uh, held in uh, Geneva since years now, and we strongly collaborate to that. So that uh, it's a gathering for thousands of humanitarians, uh, but there is a, a whole uh, dedicated uh, mm -hmm. uh, sector of this uh, conference uh, mm -hmm. uh, dedicated to the private sector. On how we can foster uh, our collaboration uh, uh, in this field, because the, this is really also from the technology point of view, they really can provide us drivers for technology uh, mm -hmm. to support uh, the effectiveness of crisis management. So yeah. there are so many uh, mm -hmm. potential rooms and platforms already taking place for collaboration. So I uh, strongly would invite them to join as right. also mm -hmm. uh, different private uh, uh, from the private sector support us for the Turkey and Syria and they presented the experience uh, we invited them to present the experience uh, at this humanitarian conference nice. so yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's an important platform also yeah. for this sector yeah great enabler and then also uh, for collaboration but also sharing good practices uh, experiences and, and right so to so to be able to create that organizational routine in a way that is needed um, Nathan, looking at you again, any questions at the chat or may, I popped may, up again? May I jump oh, in please, and please. complement on these uh, yeah. last questions? Yes, I think um, when we talk about the, the uh, use of data and to the processing of data and the data serve to, to uh, decision maker, uh, so in that case, I think, and this is also answering the question that you posed about the reorganization of these uh, uh, the um, crisis responders organizations. So I think that we have to nurture or to um, create, or I envision in the future, some um, figures in the crisis room that are, for instance, uh, uh, like uh, Jorge or like uh, some certified uh, uh, cert in the United States, where you have a figure which is an expert in the domain of crisis management and is also technological savvy, can use, does understand what is an artificial intelligence model, what could be the biases. Uh, and this, but this uh, needs to be a figure with a proper training. So we need to have some sort of uh, training for this person, certification for this person, then, uh, not me, but the European Commission or uh, an operational tool that has the mandate yeah. uh, to uh, respond and that also has the liability to protect people or to not expose people to disaster can have a service level agreement with these type of figures. I cannot tell people go out in the earthquake and take a picture. I, I cannot. We, we cannot and no one will do that. Uh, but through this organization and this figure, we can mitigate the risk and we can still collect uh, uh, um, valuable uh, data. Uh, the other thing is that I wanted to point out is that uh, I think also the, um, that uh, the European Commission Data Act is going into the right direction in that, is that we need to have access to data. This is the base point that we have. Uh, for instance, now Facebook, with Facebook, you cannot access the data. You, you could with Twitter, and this was the only one. Now you cannot anymore, at least. Uh, not if you don't have a contract. We had to have a specific contract with Twitter to get the data and to continue to get the data. Uh, with Facebook, it's not possible. With other, uh, with other um, private data, it's not possible. The Data Act is going into the, into the direction of explaining or defining, identifying when in certain uh, circumstances where they have to uh, allow uh, governments or crisis responders to get the data. And it is specified in a comma that uh, we are talking about emergency and disaster, natural uh, disaster cases. Right. So this is, a, uh, this is a good step in a good direction. I hope as forget that it will be applied in the, in the proper way. And also <clears throat> that they can actually, the private companies, because they've shown us during COVID emergency, 
Uh, we had uh, Google providing mobility data. Uh, we have some good initiatives going the, in this direction with uh, Facebook, Meta, Data for Good, for instance. They provide to crisis responders or international organizations uh, dynamic data that are respecting privacy, but they are uh, informative and dynamic. So I think that collaboration and regulation has to be two steps to, to take uh, in the future. Thank you. Well, I think actually his <laughs> Valerio's comments there somewhat touched on the question that was in the chat already, yeah. and uh, and and I think we're we're running low on time here. So rather than open it up again, I think it's also a good ending point if you agree, Case. I do, I do. Yeah, no, um, Nathan, you can have the final words, but uh, I'm happy to do that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's long day today, five thirty uh, webinar. Well, uh, we wanted to say. Uh, thanks uh, to the panelists for taking the time. I know it's the end of the day, but it, it also allowed us to make sure people could tune in and, and after work. And I think um, we had a really nice discussion. We, you know, we've met uh, all of you before in different contexts, but nice to have you here together. And and it, it feeds into what we're doing, finalizing the, the last steps of links. Yeah. Um, so really appreciate that. In case, thank you for, for moderating the, the group no here. Uh, really uh, I just say to the audience, uh, we will have a. Uh, if you're interested in links, you can always check out linksproject.eu. Uh, we're, we're finalizing the project in the last couple of months. So there'll be a lot of uh, events you can engage with us at and, and dissemination opportunities and to, to work with us. Um, we'll be in Rome the 16th and 17th of, of uh, uh, October. And we'll send out, there'll be a, uh, through our networks, there'll be some, some registration links for that event sent out soon. And um, yeah, and, and I hope that we also get a chance to collaborate more with with you, Valerio and, and Jorge and Chiara yeah. through maybe your task forces or whatever. We, you know, we generated quite a lot of, of interesting outcomes in this project on on these topics, a lot on on also the social uh, side of it and the, and the governance side of things that can be interesting to discuss. But um, so I'll just say thanks. And uh, thanks also to all the, uh, the participants and uh, that tuned in and, and to see mine for putting this together and george i think you posted something in there too oh thanks you answered the question george appreciate yeah. it no <laughs> final solution but <laughs> yeah. yeah so i think that's it huh yeah. have a good afternoon and uh, we'll be in touch thanks everyone thanks again thank you very much bye bye bye, bye. thank you so much